But Father, we are here again, yet before your word, these lives that you have so graciously given to us and this new life that you have refashioned us into is now up against and next to your word. I pray, Lord, this morning that we would take the proper posture before your word, which is a posture humble and low under your word. Would you please speak over us with these words from you to us about the power, the unrivaled power of your grace, that we might be we might be changed, that we might understand more completely, understand better who we truly are by your grace and what you have done for us under the powerful reign of your grace. We ask this in Jesus' exalted name, amen. All right, let's take our Bibles and open them up to Romans chapter 6 this morning, Romans chapter 6. We'll be looking at verse 17 this morning. Verse 17. I'm going to read a few of those verses to help you see the the context. I'm going to start in verse 14, and you can follow along as I read through to verse 19. For sin shall not be master over you. Paul is speaking to the believer in the church. Sin shall not be master over you, believer, for you are not under law as a power, but you are under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. I want you to imagine with me that you are making your way across a huge bridge that takes you across a massive, deep ravine, only to find out that three quarters of the way across, the bridge ends. Your destination, the other side, isn't reachable. Or imagine living on the 12th floor of a high-rise apartment and a fire breaks out all throughout the building. So you race to the fire escape that scales down the outside of the wall of the building toward the ground, only to find out that at about the fourth floor, it just ends. Still 100 feet up, it's just done. It was never finished. Your destination, the safety of the ground, is unreachable. What kind of a bridge building company would build a bridge like that? What kind of a fire escape company would do that? In both cases, you desperately need to reach the other side or you need to reach your destination. And in both of those cases, your destination is unreachable, unattainable. The means that was provided for you to reach your destination was completely unreliable, untrustworthy, and insufficient. What good is a bridge that doesn't reach the other side? What good is a fire escape that doesn't get all the way to the safety of the ground? Listen, listen very carefully. 
That is not the power of grace. This is not the power of grace. God has a destination for you to arrive at in sanctification, believer. He's the master designer. He is the master and perfect designer with unlimited power and resources. And he has provided a sufficient means that will indeed get you all the way to your sanctification destination. It's your bridge that reaches the other side. It's your fire escape that gets you all the way to the solid and safe ground. What is his means that gets you to your sanctification destination? It is his grace. His grace. It reigns as a power over every single one who believes Jesus Christ. This grace not only saves sinners through faith alone in Christ alone, but Romans 6 is all about how this grace in sanctification empowers the believer with all of the resources needed that gets you to your sanctification destination. So what is the sanctification destination for us? Well, Paul gives us some different ways of um, understanding it. Look in um, verse 16, you know, there's two options for slavery among the human race. You're either a slave of sin resulting in death, or here's the destination in your sanctification, a slave of obedience to God, expressing righteousness or resulting in righteous living. That's the destination. Verse 17, he refers to it this way. You became obedient from the heart. That's the sanctification destination. Obedience from the heart. Or in verse 18, you became slaves of righteousness. And so this is the good news of Romans chapter 6. God has a completely reliable, trustworthy all sufficient means for you, believer, to attain your sanctification destination. It is his grace. But tragically, near the church, and even sometimes in the church, there are those who will just never come to accept grace as a sufficient power to get one, oneself to the sanctification destination. Last time together, we called them never gracers. They're just never, never going to trust in grace. Why? Why are they this way? Here's the bottom line. They're deceived. They are. They're deceived. They trust in something that they believe has greater power in the wrong. They trust in a lie. They're confident in a sham power which is the power of law. They think you have to get under law as a power. They believe law should be the powerful means that you use to empower yourself toward your sanctification destination. And so Paul, in this great letter, the letter to the Romans... Paul is trying to establish the church. Do you remember this? Chapter 1 and chapter 16, the bookends on the letter are all, Paul expresses, I want to be with you and establish you in my gospel. This section here helps establish the church such that it makes the right choice in sanctification, in the process of becoming more and more holy, looking more and more like Jesus Christ. The church needs to know first, just to be established here, needs to know that God actually does have a sanctification destination. We are not left wandering about trying to find our own way to our own very satisfying destination that we get to choose. And then another church, well, they can choose a different destination for them. And then it's just kind of this scattered thinking about where where are we supposed to be and end up as, as believers in the way we live. No, the church needs to know that God has a sanctification destination. 
if it's going to be established. And the church needs to know which bridge it is that God provided for us to get there. Will a believer reach his or her sanctification destination under the, the power of law or under the power of grace? Which bridge reaches all the way? Which fire escape actually reaches the ground? Which man is equipped to fight against sin whenever and wherever temptation presents itself? Is it the one who is under law or the one who is under grace? So in verses 15 to 23, the last part of this chapter, Paul defends the power of grace against a slanderous attack from the never gracer who believes that actually being under a law is the only power that enables you to reach your sanctification destination. And who believes that grace as a power will, will just never get you there. And so in verses 15 to 23, Paul puts the power and the glory and the ability of grace on full display. The way that Paul talks about grace in these verses is very clear. Make no mistake, make no mistake, what God designed grace to achieve as a power in the life of the believer, it accomplishes. Make no mistake about it. Grace is presented here in all of its stunning power. The achievement of grace here is stated in absolute, sure, ultimate terms. Did you notice how you're spoken of here, believer? You are spoken of as already there at your destination. Verse 16, you are a slave of obedience resulting in righteousness. Verse 17, you became obedient from the heart. Verse 18, you've become a slave of righteousness. He doesn't say you're becoming you just are. That's your identity. And by the way, this is not an overstatement. This is not hyperbole concerning grace's achievement. This is not exaggeration for the sake of emphasizing something really important. Paul doesn't later say, you know, yeah, I, I might have overstated that a little bit. Grace is presented here in all of its stunning power. Now, let's briefly review this second defense. It takes place from verses 15 to 23. We have already covered the first one expressed in verses 1 to 14. Let's review the second one a little bit here. Gospel defense number two in verses 15 to 23. We, we are summarizing the defense this way. Grace in no way, in no way is rivaled by law in the fight against sin in the believer's life. The only power against sin for the believer is a maximum power, that is grace. It is to be under grace's reign. Therefore, grace's unrivaled power against sin in the believer, we'll review these first two, grace's unrivaled power contrasts and clarifies the only two slave categories possible. Verse 16, right in the middle there, grace first just tells us in the middle of that verse, without mincing any words, that you are slaves of the one whom you obey. That's who you are as a human being. You are a slave of the one you obey. And the way our slavery um, to a master practically works itself out is found in the first part of the verse. Um, we present ourselves to someone as slaves for obedience. I'm a slave with obedience to offer a master, and so are you. And in fact, we are willing slaves we, because we present ourselves. We're not forced into it. We just do this. This is who we are as human beings. And we present ourselves to a master such that we have obedience to offer them. And grace makes it very clear there are only the two slave options possible for humanity. One, either I am a slave of sin and that results in or expresses spiritual death before God and everybody else that I live with and around or grace has been powerful in my life, and I am instead, verse 16 at the end, a slave of obedience 
obedience to God resulting in or expressing righteousness or righteous practice, righteous living. And the whole point that Paul is making here is only grace gets you all the way from one slavery to sin to the other slavery to obedience to God. It is the only bridge that reaches the destination. The only difference between the slave of sin and the slave of obedience to God, the only difference is the grace of God. That's it. It's the only difference. And so the point that's being made is is on the opposite as well. Law as a power will never, ever get you from slavery to sin to slavery to obedience to God. Law as a power is a worthless bridge that does not reach all the way across. Law as a power is a worthless fire escape that doesn't even, that, that leaves you hanging. In fact, what law as a power does is it cuffs you and leads you back into the fire. The difference between the one who's a slave to sin and the one who is a slave to obedience is not that the one got some power of law under his belt and transformed himself. Grace's unrivaled power, number two, and this is still review, creates thankfulness to God for my new slavery, verse 17. But thanks be to God. Grace is the only power that can turn the believer toward God away from self with thanksgiving. Listen, if... If, and I speak as if insane, if law as a power was able to achieve the sanctification destination, then the sinner under law in the end could only thank himself. He'd get the glory. Paul here in verse 17 has something of a thanksgiving outburst as he considers what grace has achieved. Paul's mind is directed away from even the believer, away from the church for a moment. In our own lives, we are responsible in our own lives for our sanctification under the power of grace where we have to help each other as a church family in our growth and our progress and sanctification. But Paul's mind is turned away from all of us to God. When we are saved by grace through faith alone, and when we are under the power of grace and sanctification, we're like Paul here. We're not able to contain thankfulness. We're not able to restrain our thanksgiving to God because we are truly in a better slavery than we ever were before by grace's unrivaled power. And now with me today, consider thirdly, grace's unrivaled power delivered me over to a teaching pattern or delivered me over to a teaching form or delivered me over to a teaching mold and he delivered me over with heart-generated obedience. With heart-generated obedience. Verse 17, you became obedient from the heart and we're gonna focus on this part specifically to that form of teaching in which you, uh, to which you were committed. So listen, if the goal or the destination in sanctification is verse 16, an obedience that expresses itself in righteousness, then grace's power must get you there. Grace's power must get you there, unquestionably. Think on it. How can I, in my obedience to God, how can I express righteous thinking? How, in my obedience to God, can I communicate with righteous words? How can I, in my obedience to God, express a righteous attitude in the worst of circumstances? How can I express righteous desires? How can I do righteous deeds? How can I conduct myself in my relationships in a righteous way? How will I even know what 
the righteous thoughts are that I should think? How will I even know what the righteous attitude is, the righteous deeds, the righteous desires, etc.? How will I even know? Well, the answer is given in verse 17. At the end, you were committed to that form of teaching. You were committed to a form of teaching to get you to the sanctification destination where you will express righteous living. The power of grace committed you to a a form of teaching. There's a teaching from God that will help you arrive at the righteous practice you must express. Now, this um, verb here to, in verse 17 at the end, to which you were committed, I think it's better to translate it as delivered over to or handed over to or turned over to, given up to. And I want to show you how Paul uses this verb in a couple of different places here in Romans. So I want you to turn back for a moment so we can understand this. Go back to Romans chapter 1, verse 24. I think this is going to be helpful. And by the way, this is, this is a good practice as you're reading and you're trying to figure out maybe what a word means or what a phrase is after or a clause. You, you go look for it in the author in the same letter, right? That's what you do first. Look at verse 24. Therefore, God gave them the human race over, that's the verb, in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. God gave them over. Look at verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. Look at verse 28. And just as they, the human race, did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Three times, God gave them over. Now, in that context, when we were in that about 10 years ago, it seems now, is, are, there, are there any doubts? Are there any doubts whether God actually did that? I mean, how certain was that giving over? I mean, did any of the human race only make it about three quarters of the way there? And then fall short? Or did they all make it to impurity? Did they all make it to degrading passions? Did they all, did we all make it to a depraved mind? Or or is this only hyperbole? Is, Is this exaggeration for the sake of emphasis? And you know the answer. No. There is only certainty in what God did in this delivering over. Now, that's a negative context. Your context determines whether the verb is being used in a positive way or a negative way. Let's go to Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Romans 4, verse 25. He, that is Jesus our Lord, who was raised from the dead in verse 24, he is the one who was delivered over Because of our transgressions. Obviously, that is in his death at the cross. Now, is there any doubts as to whether or not God did that at the cross? Any doubts about that? Any uncertainty there? Is is this hyperbole? Is this exaggeration for the sake of emphasis? I mean, was God the Father's intent to deliver Jesus over because of our transgressions, but then God the Father stopped short of that? Or he just wasn't able to do it all the way? Now, there's only certainty spoken of here in coming off of this passage. Let me show you one more. Go to Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Very familiar verse. Very similar, but this one takes it even to a greater extent. Look at this, verse 32. He, God, who did not spare his own son, but, here it is, delivered him over for us all, How will he not also with him freely give us all things? This really makes the point and then even expands on it. Precisely because God did not go halfway with delivering his son over to his wrath at the cross, all the more so we can be fully and completely sure that God will give us everything we need in sanctification. Everything we need. 
He won't take us halfway in our sanctification because he didn't take his son halfway in delivering him over. But instead, he will, verse 32, he will freely give us all things. Notice what it doesn't say. He will partially give us most things. There's only certainty in this passage as well with this verb. So let's go back to Romans chapter 6, and let's let that inform us in verse 17. You, it says at the end of the verse, you were committed, or you, believer, were delivered over to a form or a pattern or a mold of teaching. You were delivered over. Now, where's the doubt in this? There is none. God did this. The one who did this delivering over is the same God who delivered the human race over in his judgment and is the same one who delivered his son over in judgment in our place. God unquestionably delivers the believer over to a form of teaching such that righteous living can be expressed because that's the destination we must arrive at. And this is only achieved by and under the power of the grace of God. This doesn't happen under the sham power, under the perceived brute force of law as a power. To reach that sanctification destination, God did not say to us as slaves of sin, he said, here, slave, uh, here's, here's law. See if you can get some power from that and build a bridge to get to my destination that pleases me. If righteous living is the destination for our slave obedience to God, grace's unrivaled power had to do something and do it decisively, do it completely, do it unquestionably. Without a doubt, without a half-hearted attempt, God's unrivaled grace had to deliver us over to a form of teaching from God to equip us, to guide us so we can carry out that righteous living. Listen, don't doubt it. Do not doubt if God actually did this in you, believer. Or, or even this morning, if you are an unbeliever and you know it, don't doubt that God can do this for you or not. Think back to Romans 1. Did he hand over the human race to impurity? Did he hand over the human race to degrading passions? Did he hand over the human race to a depraved mind? Uh, yeah, he did. Decisively so, without a doubt then make no mistake about the sufficiency of his grace in sanctification. You are under grace. Believer, not under law. Did God sufficiently deliver his son over because of our transgressions? Did he sufficiently deliver him over as our substitute in our place? Yeah, unquestionably so. Then never doubt whether his powerful grace actually handed you over to a form of teaching so that righteous living could be the expression of your life, believer. Unbeliever, listen, if, if, if you're hearing this and you're like, I, I've been around this stuff, but I, I know I'm not saved. I know I'm not. That's not me. I want you to listen. The God of Scripture, this God, is able he is able to save you entirely and change your life so thoroughly that you will arrive at his destination for you. What you have been slavishly living under, in, under sin, this God, he can make you new. You must trust Christ, and you must trust him alone, and you must do it today, right now. Verse 17, it says, we were delivered over to a form of teaching, a form. 
That word form only confirms the certainty of this. That word form, it always implies conformity to it. It always implies conformity to it, that it is something like an example. In fact, oftentimes it's translated as an example. Or it's an example standard. It's a a mold standard that must be conformed to. You can translate it as pattern. You can translate it as form or mold or example. It's a mold that, that you have to get your life into so that you can take the shape of it, conformity to it. Paul used this word frequently on a horizontal level for believers, how he and how his delegates like Timothy and Titus um, and other believers were even to be examples, an example, a pattern, so that you could take your life and match it up to it and conform to it. Let me show you a few of these verses because I think this will help you as well. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Timothy 4, one of the other things we're doing here, now we're leaving Romans, but we're looking still at Paul, right? So we're staying with the same author, trying to see how he uses this word. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Timothy 4, 12. Let no one, Paul says to Timothy, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, Show yourself an example of those who believe. What does it mean to believe? Well, here's an example of how one lives. Show yourself to be that so people can take their life and match it up. Let's look over at Titus chapter 2, verse 7. Titus, on the island of Crete, among some churches that are Barely even churches. They're in a lot of trouble. Paul says to him in verse 7, in all things of chapter 2, in all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds. And in particular, his, his example of good deeds fits within the young men of the church, that section in verse 6 to 8. And so Titus was to be a an example for the young men in the church who could take their living as as young believers and they could put their life up to his example and match it, conform themselves to it. Let me show you another one. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9. Just go back a few pages. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9. Paul tells them they didn't eat anyone's bread as he was there as an apostle, bringing the gospel to them, and they kept working night and day so that they wouldn't be a burden to any of them. And he says in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 9, he says, not because we do not have a right to this. He did as an apostle. He could get his living from the gospel. But in order to offer ourselves as a, here's the word, a model for you, to what end? What does he say? So that you would what? Follow our example, to be a model. One more, Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, all of these written by Paul, all the way that he likes to use this word. Philippians three seventeen. This one's great. You got about, you got several different ways of expressing the same thing. Philippians three seventeen. brethren, church, Join in following my example. That's not the word. And observe those who walk according to the pattern. There's the word you have in us. So Paul's life as an apostle was indeed an example. But now he's telling the Philippians that there are others who were living according to that pattern that was his life. And now he's telling other believers, observe those guys who are doing that. You understand, on a horizontal level, a, a, one believer can be an example standard, a pattern standard, um, a mold standard that you can put your life before or up to and make it match. 
the behavior of these believers in these different passages here become the mold standards that other believers were to put their lives into so that they could take on the shape of those lives, that righteousness. Now let's go back to, Philippi, or to Romans chapter 6, verse 17. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. You were delivered over to that form, that model, that model of teaching. It is a standard mold. That teaching is a standard mold or a standard pattern, a standard form that the believer must put his life into, make it match so that it takes on the shape of that teaching. It's very similar to what Paul says in Titus chapter 2, verse 1, when he says, But as for you, Titus, speak the things which are fitting for sound teaching. Speak to the older men, speak to the older women, speak to the younger women, speak to the younger men, speak even to the believing slaves of the household. Speak to them about the things, which is all the behaviors of how they were supposed to live, the things which were fitting with sound teaching. So again, if the goal, if the destination in sanctification is told to us in verse 16, which is obedience that results in or expresses righteousness, then grace's power must get you there, believer, unquestionably so. So how can I, in my obedience to God, express righteous thinking, righteous words, righteous attitudes and deeds and desires? How can I go about my relationships in a righteous way? Well, it's answered. God in his grace, delivered you over to the right destination. To get you to the destination where you express that righteousness, the power of grace delivered you over, unquestionably so, to a standard mold of teaching. There is teaching from God that will help you to take your life and conform it to that standard. That's what's being said. You were decisively delivered over. The language is thorough. Grace is powerfully thorough. It reaches the destination God designed for it, for every single one who believes. But I want you to remember that grace has done even more. Last week or two, time, two weeks ago, we talked about the important words that appear right before this statement in verse 17. You, you, you became obedient from the heart, believer, to that form, to that standard to which you were delivered over to. Listen, the old you, believer, the old you who used to be a slave to sin, expressing spiritual death everywhere in your life, that old you is not across the bridge on the new land of obedience to God. That slave of sin expressing that spiritual death in everything was crucified with Christ, was buried with him. Remember that? And you are not still that old identity trying now your hardest to do righteous things. That's not you. You are a new you, believer. A new you on the other side at the destination God intended for you. Grace, by its power, has transformed you to become obedient from the heart. God didn't transform, uh, transport and put you on the other side of slavery to obedience to God without also changing you. It would have been one thing just to take you and put you over there, but he changed you when he put you over there. Because you were under grace, 
and not under law, the power of the law, you are different at the very heart level. And you're different towards the word of God now. So then there should be absolutely no doubt. There should be no doubt. The way that Paul is writing here doesn't encourage you to question this, but only be sure of it, to be certain. There should be no doubt about whether or not you can trust the reigning power of grace over your life, believer, to get you to God's sanctification destination. God has a teaching standard that your life must be conformed to. As you conform yourself to it, you express righteous living. And the reigning power of grace decisively delivered you over to that standard, that form, with a new life. He did it by transforming you at the heart level such that deep within, heart-joined, heart-generated, the inner you obeying from the inside out, that you would obey that standard mold of teaching that ensures that you will express righteousness in how you live. Grace, with all of its power and all of its resources, it is the bridge that reaches all the way to the new slavery to obedience that God designed for you. Have no doubt. Have no doubt. You became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. What is the teaching? What is the only possibility? What's the only possibility? What teaching could be the only standard or form that the reigning power of grace would trust as a pattern for righteous living. And grace by its power, it made for you a new heart-generated obedience, right? Will grace deliver that new you over to just any old teaching? Will grace deliver that new you over to the opinions of men, the traditions of men, the philosophizing of the scribes of this age? Obviously, this teaching is what? It's the word of God. It's the word of God that the apostles delivered in their preaching of the gospel. It includes the sacred Old Testament scriptures, plus even the apostles' new teaching that is even coming through this letter as he writes. And these two testimonies from God, these two testaments, the older one and the newer one, all of that scripture is breathed out by God and is what? Profitable. For what? Teaching. That's it. It's profitable for teaching. And when we are taught, oftentimes we need to be what? Corrected or reproved. It's reproved next, right? Teaching reproof, that's it. Trying to rely on my aging memory. Teaching leads to reproof. But God doesn't just leave us there. Reproof must be what? Corrected. For what, ultimately? We be trained in Righteousness, righteous living. This is the word of God. Now, do you notice in this passage how God's word, that form of teaching to which you were committed, do you notice how it's spoken of like it is an exalted destination? You notice that? And you and I as believers, we are spoken of like, in all actuality, humble slaves who have been delivered over to a new master. And so I want to just ask you as we, as we finish up here, what, what, is, what has been your attitude and your view of yourself lately before the word of God? I want you to think about you for a moment. What is, 
your attitude? What is your view of yourself lately before the word of God? Do you see yourself like a, a humble and, and lowly servant who has been decisively delivered over to an authoritative standard? Do you think of yourself in this humble place before the word of God when, when you're reading your Bible on your own or when you're sitting under the preaching of God's word? Do you see yourself as one who must be lowly and must be under it so that you can conform your life to it or do you sit in judgment of it? It's a very dangerous place to be we have been delivered over to it like a humble slave if we are believers. And what thankfulness there is in our hearts that we have become obedient to that form of teaching to which we were delivered. So what is your attitude and your view of yourself as of late? And then what is your attitude or your view of, of the word of God? Do, do you have a high view of scripture? An exalted scripture. Do, do you see an exalted scripture in front of you? Do you see it as an exalted destination that, that you must humbly arrive at to be changed so that you can live out righteousness? Listen, I know you know this. I'm not going to tell you anything that you haven't already felt or experienced in your own life. But it is possible to get into a pattern and a way of thinking because of hurriedness, because of our own pride, because of our own desire for independence. It is possible to view the word of God as a smaller thing than us. You know, a little something you add to your, your very busy and important life. You know, the word of God is a, a little pick-me-up for my busy day. Does that sound like the language of Romans 6, verse 17? We as believers need to be really careful how our attitude can subtly be actually inverted and flipped upside down and backwards and where we become the exalted destination and God's word becomes my little verse of my day boost. That is not what's going on, and that is not what God did with us, and that is not how God uses and views his word. The language of Romans 6, verse 17, doesn't reflect that kind of attitude or approach to God's teaching in scripture. Grace is put on in all of its, here put forward in all of its stunning power. And God's word is lifted high above us so that we might reach the destination that God determined for us in sanctification, that we would live righteous lives, that our lives would be different. Has your life changed? Has Jesus Christ changed you by the power of his grace? You can't change your own life. That would just be using the power of law. It isn't gonna work. It's going to ruin you even more. You must come to Christ. You must believe him. You must cast yourself on him. You must believe him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we indeed want to humble ourselves as a church under your word, and we want to, as a church family, we want to lift your word high up over us we want to do that because we recognize that you have delivered us over decisively to it. Thank you, Father, that everything you do to save us, everything you do to sanctify us is sufficient and complete. And Father, where our hearts break is when our lives do not conform to your pattern as believers. And Father, what we know this morning is that the fault there, when that happens in us, it does not fall upon your grace as if your grace did not do what it was supposed to do. The fault lies squarely on us as believers who still 
have indwelling sin. Oh, Lord, may it sober us how deceitful sin is. That sometimes, even though we are to present ourselves as slaves for obedience to you, even sometimes we are so deceived by our indwelling sin and we still act the slave of sin. How much worse does it seem our disobedience and our sin is than the unbeliever's sin? He sins according to his condition. We sin contrary to our new identity. Oh, Lord in heaven, would you forgive us? And would you impress us all the more with not our own abilities, but with the power of your grace within to change us? We desperately need you. We can make no progress without you. And we pray in Christ's name, amen.